Good Monday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast and happy 2022. We are back after a four week hiatus uh, for the winter months. Uh, I will be upfront and say that I am probably still recovering from my surgery. So this is being all pre taped in 2021. So uh, this is what's happening. And this is the way that the world works in today's age. Some things have to be planned ahead and I'm planning ahead just in case uh, my recovery is taking a little bit longer. But to welcome our, us back, I am pleased, I'm honored, and I'm not sure if she actually does know this, but my former member of parliament is with us today uh, for Northumberland, Peterborough South. I knew her back in 2011 when she first ran in the riding of Northumberland, uh, Miss Kim Rudd. Kim, thank you so much for doing this. Great to be here, Chris, and thank you. And I know you've moved west, but we still think of you as a, you know, NPS boy. <laughs> I, I will always be a Newcastle boy in, the, in my heart. As much as Calgary is my home, Newcastle is where my heart is. Um, Kim, I ask all my interviewees the same question to kick off the show is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, wow. Um... You know, I think it's just who I am. And I would say a big part of it came from my mother and my grandmother, who were both very strong union women. My mother was the first female staff, staff, first female staff rep for the Steelworkers Union. Uh, she led the Radio Shack Tandy uh, strike that was quite famous back in, I guess it'd be the early 80s. There's, um, and my grandma would, grandmother's a shop steward at Lloyd's Baby Carriages. Um, she was a seamstress by trade and, and always not just involved in their union, but in their community. And if there was a right, uh, a wrong that needed to be righted or something that needed to be made better, um, they, it, as I said, I think it's just in my DNA. Um getting into elected politics is uh, is a gambit in itself growing up in your household i'm assuming you were indoctrinated with politics if your parents were in the union so was politics discussed at the dinner table as it was in my household it was what was interesting is my mother was a liberal until um there were um my father had an accident and uh, was burnt very badly and couldn't work. And, and we, we struggled anyways financially before any of that. And, and there was alcoholism and there was a number of challenges in my family. And, and when my dad was hurt, uh, my mother had to leave her part-time job and go to work in a factory because that was the only way she was going to be able to support us. And she worked afternoon shift. Um, I was about nine, 10 years old. And I would come home from school and look after the younger ones while she went to work. My dad um, was unable to do much at that time. And um, it was, so politics was discussed in a way that, that sort of, um, I won't say it brought our family together uh, for sure. It was, uh, you know, the Vietnam War was happening at the time, and that was a whole other political discussion, not, you know, related as much to Canada, but that was a whole discussion with very strong feelings. There was the whole um, uh, sort of um, the whole education reform happening. There was just a lot happening. And so people would take various positions, and, and let's just say there wasn't much convincing done. Sounds like a, a traditional uh, family dinner at the Brown household was there was many people on many different sides of the political spectrum, all having dinner and politics was one of those topics that we love to talk about. But as we left, we went, oh, why'd we talk about it? Help us. Yes, I know. Um, so you, your, your journey into elected politics federally starts in 2011. Had you thought about it prior to 2011 to put your name forward? Or what was the decision behind putting your name forward in 2011? Because for those who don't remember, 2011, the Liberals were under Michael Ignatieff. Uh, that was the, uh, the uh, election that the Liberals were reduced to third place. Uh, what was the decision behind getting involved in 2011, if that was your first time? 
Well, it's interesting because I think, as you know, Chris, I'm an entrepreneur. I own my own businesses. I've been very involved in the community and in, in child care. I started a, a large not-for-profit organization, which started in 1985 and still going strong. And, um, and I was president of the Chamber of Commerce. And, and so I was very engaged and I became the co-chair of the Ontario uh, Coalition for Better Child Care during that time, and then sat on the national board. So I was really starting to have some, and with the Chamber of Commerce doing some of that kind of uh, outreach as well. And so I was, I was really engaged um, and people knew me. And I'd been here, you know, I've lived here for over 40 years. And how it actually happened in 2009 was someone asked me to run. That's it. it. He was a community member. I sat on the board of directors with him for children's case coordination. And the former member, Paul Macklin, had been a member for about five and a half years. He had lost two elections subsequent to his sitting in the House. And he, he wasn't, no one thought he was going to run again. And so the group got together and said, well, who? And Martin um, and a couple others put my name forward and I got a phone call from Mark. He says, we'd like you, like you to come over and chat with us. And they asked me to run. And I came home and I said to my husband, you're not going to believe this, but how do you feel about this? And he said, we're in. Like, let's go. If you want to do wow. it, we're going to do it. Of course, he always said that to me. And um, so in 2009, I, uh, I went into a three-way nomination race. I was not the favorite candidate, for sure. Um, and the, just because it was old guard and there were people who, you know, had, you know, how that kind of, I, I'm a, I'm I a, li- I'm a former liberal from Durham, Ontario. I know exactly yes, okay, what you're you talking know. about. <laughs> the same people been in the association for 25 years and there was no such thing, nothing, need, nothing, there was no change needed. And, um, so I went in the three-way race. I won it uh, handily. And um, unfortunately, the two people that rang against me never, never appeared on the, on the, and that happens. And it's really unfortunate. Uh, one was a mayor at the time and the other was a teacher. And, and sometimes I think you, when, when I was asked to run and we said, yes, I had, well, I'd never sat you know, people often say municipal politics or provincial is a stepping stone. I'd never done that, but I had a really wide breadth of experience across a whole bunch of fronts and had uh, sort of been in the milieu of, of, you know, trying to bring people together to, to get things done. And so I felt I was, I was equipped and I had supportive family and friends, which is important. And I was of an age and uh, that it was easy for me to say yes. Some of my younger colleagues who I admire greatly, who have, you know, they're balancing children and lives and what have you, and, and they do a phenomenal job. But so I, I'd say I had it kind of easy to make that decision, easier than a lot. Um, you mentioned provincial stepping stone. For someone who was in the daycare sector and still is, I'm assuming, who probably has a passion for this, in 2011, it was not a federal issue. It has now become a federal issue with Justin Trudeau's $10 a day daycare, but it was more of a provincial issue. When you got asked, did you ever have that come to moment, come to like realization moment and go, maybe it's better if I go into provincial because I know Lou Rinaldi was the ML MPP for the area, but yeah. provincial politics might've been a better fit or was it always like, they asked federally, why not? Well, kind of, they asked federally and Lou does it, did a fabulous job. And uh, I worked really well with, with him and um, he's since retired. The, um, the whole sort of realm of childcare, if you remember, well, you will remember the Kelowna Accord. So I was engaged in that process and we were there, we, we, we spilled blood, if you will, uh, you know, it, uh, trying to get to the place where we could get agreement with all the provinces and territories and, and, and Ken Dryden and Carolyn Bennett and so many others and the work that they did. And I was part of that process. And when Jack Layton toppled, sided with Stephen Harper and toppled the government and we lost the Kelowna Accord, 
that was a defining moment for me. And so when I was asked to go into national politics, uh, federal politics, I, I hearkened back to that time and thought, we did that work. And it just went in a minute. And if I'm there, I'm going to do my best to make sure that we don't have that happen again. So um, that was, to your point about provincial politics, that was really in the back of my mind. So I, I have to ask the the, 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 the the candidate question now here for you. Why the Liberals in 2011? Because traditionally the Liberals are the centrist party and Mike Lignatiev mm -hmm. at the time sort of brought them to more of the center right part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, why the Liberals in that time? Was it just they asked and you said sure or was there something about Mike Lignatiev that you said I, I can get behind this leader? Not the latter. Um, it was, I mean, I liked Michael and we got along really well. Um, I don't believe he was the right leader for the party. I had been very engaged in liberal politics up until that point, um, provincially and federally. Christine Stewart was before Paul Macklin. I was involved with her on a, a rural transportation um, project that we were doing and I worked on her campaign I worked on Paul's campaign I worked on Lou Rinaldi's campaign um Joan Fawcett I go back to the Joan Fawcett days wow so there's a name so I haven't I heard have, in a long time <laughs> I know and she just passed away uh, very a year or so ago so um so I have I have been a liberal for many years because I am center yeah. I I am a uh, you know, I think pragmatic. Um, I do believe in fiscal responsibility, but with fiscal responsibility has also comes social responsibility. And I think um, getting that balance right is a very tough thing to do. There's no question. Um, but at the end of the day, if we as um, governments, and we've seen it happen around the world, move to the outer spectrums of some of the positions of parties, we can find ourselves in some really in a very difficult way. So the center, um, the center party was always my party. Understandable. Um, going back to that 2011 election, I, I remember that election. I, I, I was sort of a, I had just come off. Actually, I was just at that time working at Queens Park for a few months doing a transition because the uh, October election, I lost my job like a few uh, M MPPs at the time. But I want, I've always, I always find it interesting to ask this question to candidates. What does it feel like to see your name on the ballot? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, surreal. Mm -hmm. And 2011, if you, I, that was a tough election. Um, and we worked, we did everything we could. There was nothing we left on the table. And um, we knocked on over 20,000 doors um, because I became a candidate, because I own my own business, I hired someone to help run it so I could, you know, sort of devote more of my time. And it really, it was an election that, um, it was an election that was tough, but I'll tell you, it was the best training ground I've ever had because it is, um, it's elections are, elections are, are tough slogs. There's nothing pretty and glamorous about them. You're on your feet 18 hours a day. You have to, Listen, I, I've had the good fortune of having amazing teams, great, uh, campaign managers and, and operations managers and teams, and you have to listen to them. And you have to, you know, you bring them on for a reason because you have a goal. And 2011 taught me that that listening, that clear focus of being the candidate and not the campaign manager and not the, you know, social media person and not the anything was a huge um, piece of important learning for me that carried me into 2015. Because it is for type A personalities like me who are used to running their own businesses and you know, sort of managing life, having to sit back and, and not um, run all those things is kind of weird. So uh, 2011, um, there were some tough lessons for me, but they made me a better candidate hands down. 
And for those who are listening, if you do not know the riding of Northumberland, it is uh, driving probably, uh, well, Port Hope to, uh, was it Brighton at the time? Brighton or Trenton? No, it was past Trenton. It was past, it was almost it was, to Belleville. Yes, because it was uh, Trenton Air Force Base. It was Northumberland, Quinty West. It was, yeah, That's the right. new riding, the one that we have now. I was the first MP for the new riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South. And it's 3,001 square kilometers. Um, the, when it was Northumberland, Quinty West, it was even bigger. So it, that is basically driving, if I, if I can remember driving that, because I used to go to Loyalist College and I drove back and forth a few times. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that's almost a two and a half, three hour drive. If you're just yeah. nonstop, not hitting any of the off on routes, it's two and a half hours from side to side. It is a large riding in the Ontario. It is right near the Lake Ontario. It's just like it was at the time, just outside of the GTA. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and, and they're distinct and unique communities. None, it, you know, a lot of rural area. And, and I think I, I think I would do, because I did Santa Claus parades even as a, in between elections. I get, after 2011, I decided to do it again. Did and you? I actually, yes. And I thought, no way we're going to do this. We learned a lot. And I actually started to realize that I had to sell my businesses if I was really going to put my mind to this because I couldn't be in two places and I had great team managers running but like any small business it's really the owner that's the you know the pusher if you will so I did and um was that, that a hard loss allowed me no it wasn't because I had done it for so long like I I like it was 12 years um, for one of my businesses and probably seven for the other. And um, I owned a private career college and a first aid and CPR training company. So, so no, it was good. It was a good move for me. Uh, personally, it was time. It allowed me to concentrate. And so I was at every fall fair. I was at every Santa Claus parade. I, I wasn't, and I wasn't even a candidate again. I was just the person that you know was promoting the liberal brand in our riding and and so um but i think while i was the mp i think i do 11 or 12 santa claus parades a season and one particular day every year there's four of them yeah so uh, and it, probably all on the opposite ends of this riding as well oh, <laughs> absolutely newcastle Orno, Campbellford, Colburn. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, I remember covering those. Um, I, I discovered those little hot pocket things that you put in your boots and your hands. I discovered those. <laughs> um, so you, you're, you're doing this for four years. You're trying to connect with communities. You have in the back of your head, you're going to run again in 2015, the next election. Correct. Uh, in 2015... Uh, the Liberals were still in third place. They had a new leader who was our current Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, and you decided to put your name forward again in 2015. Was this a contested nomination? I, I wasn't there because I was out in uh, Peace River Westlock being the candidate for the Liberal Party there. So, uh, God, love you. Uh, Northern Alberta as a Liberal, it's <laughs> If you, if you ever want to have some guns pointed at you, I would suggest going up there running as a liberal. I'm not joking there. Um, so it wasn't a contested nomination. And, and it wasn't because I was a de facto candidate. I had been working and, you know, and I was in Ottawa regularly sitting in on um, uh, Carolyn Bennett started a women's um, she, there was women's caucus and Carolyn Bennett would invite us to the candidates people who were you know had been candidates were interested again um, there they were the liberal party was extremely inclusive of people who were wanting to build their their skill set um, of getting ready for 2015 and I was um, at the time Justin Trudeau now Prime Minister Trudeau's uh, Eastern Ontario chair for his campaign. Oh, wow. Okay. So quick little story. Um, I got a call from the team uh, in Ottawa when he was in leadership and um, he 
he um, he needed to get through Eastern Ontario, but it's not an easy place to get through. I mean, you can't exactly fly. The train is, you know, will only get you to the south end. And so I remember saying to Marlene Floyd, I said, well, I can just come and pick him up. I said, Tom and I are coming up for a hockey game. Tom could take the train home and I'll pick him up and we can do it. And it was uh, Valentine's uh, week. And um, I remember him singing this, you know, riding shotgun in my car, uh, calling and ordering flowers for Sophie and, and doing CBC interviews. And, and uh, Adam Scotty, the photographer was in the back seat as was Mike McNair who wrote The Green Shift. And along the way, we picked up Navdeep Gaines once and uh, ended up in Peterborough at the arena with Aunt Anna Gainey at a Pete's game. So two and a half days. And uh, so, you to know, be a fly on that wall, to be a fly on that wall, just imagine the conversations. You probably have conversations you're going to take to your grave and just, I would love to pick your brain off the record one day and just <laughs> sit down and be like, what was said? <laughs> Do you know, he was working so hard, we hardly got a chance to talk oh, because wow. he's just constantly on the phone, reading policy, briefings. It was pretty amazing. I don't, he works, he's, he just worked so hard. And um, so what the other side of that is, is in Northumberland, Peterborough South, we had an all candidates means for the leaders and Justin Trudeau didn't come, but uh, Karen McCrimmon did and Mark Garno and there were a number of others and Mark asked me to come at the local hotel in Coburg at the Woodlawn Inn and said Kim I'd like to have breakfast and talk and so he asked me if I'd support his leadership and I felt so bad because I consider Mark a dear friend and and um, I just I I couldn't I I really felt that that um Justin Trudeau was was the person we needed to lead, especially after Michael Ignatieff. Um, and so anyways, Mark and I remain very good friends. That's good. <laughs> we pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to Patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Um, let's jump back to that 2015 election. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Rick Norlock is your conservative opponent, correct? Or did he did he announce his resignation? No. Retire? He retired. It was Adam Moulton, whose dad owned the Canadian Tire. Yes. Okay. So Adam was 23 years old, 24 years old. 24 relatively years old, new like to the Conservative Party. Relatively new. So you are the sort of the name recognized candidate on the ballot. Correct. Mm -hmm. Did that help you? Because I, 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 I know national campaigns matter. They matter locally, but Locally, I think people want to vote for the person that they recognize on the ballot and they know. Do you think your name being on there the second time helped a little bit? No question. I mean, it really is about the leader, especially in a riding, a swing riding like this. Mm -hmm. You, if the leader's numbers are high, there's a chance we'll take it. But um, like I only won by less than 3%. And um, it was, we are, we are a very social conservative riding. We just are. And I was helped by a number of good friends who are conservative, um, of the red Tory variety, um, who voted for me and who helped me. And, and NDP, a uh, lot of my friends who are NDP voted for me. Electoral reform was part of that. Um, and, it didn't work out the way everyone had, you know, sort of hoped it would. And I felt some of that pain in 2019 for sure. Um, but 2015 really, um, you could feel on Thanksgiving Monday, Justin Trudeau and the bus uh, came to Port Hope and we had to shut down the streets. It was a sunny afternoon, Thanksgiving Monday, the press bus, um, and there were a thousand people on the street in Port Hope. And you could just 
feel the energy. And uh, so very shortly thereafter was, you know, D-Day or Ballot Day. And, yeah, I remember the getting the, the Orno Weekly Times the day after that happened out here in Alberta reading it and on the front page was a picture of you and justin trudeau holding hands with your arms up and i went there's something going on in port hope because port hope is not traditionally a liberal stronghold and i was shocked and i was like okay she's gonna win this um well yeah yes at about midnight i found out <laughs> it was so long they so let's, counting us let's, let's talk about election night because this is the big day for you this is <laughs> All your hard work, all the last four and a half years, almost six years, if you town, go back to 20, uh, 2000, 2009, six years of work, you get the green check mark. You get the congratulations. You are the MP elect for the new riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South. What's your mm -hmm. first, what's, what's going through your head? Um, you, actually, my mom because my mom passed away at 58 uh, in 1998. And uh, it was something that she ran twice, provincially and federally for the NDP in a riding similar to what you ran, in, Chris, in terms of her ability to, to, to win. And I just knew that she was there, that she would be very proud of me and my family who, like my husband knocked on as many doors as I did. It was, it was crazy. He, and he's an engineer. And he thought campaign knocking on doors. I don't think this is for me. Well, it turns out he quite loved it. He says maybe not love, but he was very good at it. Um, so, and I think the, the other thing, the, the sort of maybe the third thing that sort of I felt more than I thought. And that is um, in 2011, when I lost, the volunteers and the team were devastated. We ran such a great campaign and they were just so hopeful. And you ask any candidate that it's, they fare better generally than their team. And I just felt so happy for them after all the work they put in and the disappointment in 2011. And it was like they were all, you know, they were just like a kid in candy store. This is amazing. So for me, it was really about the people who helped me get there and how excited they were. And then of course, reality came and the job came. And then I thought, oh, wow, this is a lot. <laughs> well, you, you have the pleasure of being one of a few thousand, if not 2000 people to ever have served in the House of Commons. Um, <laughs> You get elected, there's a weight put on your shoulders like no one can explain except the people who have been able to serve in that position. Even the staffers wouldn't know that pressure because you are the face of the public now. Walking into the House of Commons for the very first time after you were sworn in and put your name on the oath roll, take me through that moment because I, 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 I always, uh, that's why I ran in 2015 because I wanted to experience that, but take, what was it like for you? It was, it was kind of surreal. It is when you're first selected, there's a whole technical process, of course, you have to go through it. And, and um, I had somebody with me for it because you can't absorb it all. And it has to be done in, you know, you don't have a lot of time to, to sort of muse over this. And so when I was sworn in, I was, I had, we took a bus to Ottawa. We probably have 50 people on it. My family, people who would, uh, you know, help supporters. And they were all there in the room when I signed um, my, um, into the scroll. And it was, it was like, it was, I don't want to say it was, it's really hard to describe. It's, it's like, you can't believe it's happening, I guess is the best way I'd say. And then after that, I am now an MP. I can go anywhere and, can, and still can go anywhere in the precinct in Ottawa and not have to just show my pen and I'm there. Really? I don't have to show my ID. Even I don't as a... have to go. Former, I have the right to enter the House of Commons and any building in the precinct without um, any impediment, as does my husband. 
Uh -huh. well, I, I know. Remember. Now I can't go into the chamber, of course, <laughs> but uh, unless unless it's risen for the day, um, but I can go into anywhere in uh, without impediment. So I took all of these amazing folks and we went into the House of Commons and we, you know, I could show them and and it was center block at the time with so much history. And then we went into the dining room and had lunch and uh, in the famous dining room, which is no more right now. And so it was it was kind of like the most amazingly perfect day that you can't even you can't even absorb it all. It's just so amazing. It's really hard to describe. Getting into politics, you have an idea of what you're going to expect when you get elected. You you expect the good and you expect the bad. Let's talk about the good before we talk about the bad. Was it what you expected being an MP? It was. It was. I knew, I knew because I had been so involved and I took advantage of the opportunities to be in Ottawa, to, to sit and watch committees, because you can do that as an as a individual. And so I learned, I, I prepared myself as best I could. And, you know, there are people who run just to run and just to become the MP. But there are people, many of us, who actually looked at it as though we were going for, for you know, this huge job where we had to do all of this research and work first in order to be the best we could be to present ourselves. And um, so it was what I expected. The days were you know, generally 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, you, Both in you, Ottawa you know, and at home? Yes, for sure. And my husband, my family, amazing because I would come home. So I was a parliamentary secretary, as you know, for now. Which we'll resources. talk about here in a few seconds. <laughs> right. So that changed, that added to my, not just my <laughs> workload, but my travel schedule a lot. Um, and my time added to my time in Ottawa, less time in the riding. And so, so the, the thing that I found the good was we had lots of exciting projects to work on and we were we had lots of good policy and legislation to work through to get through. That was all the positive. The negative was that it sure as heck isn't easy. It's 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 soul destroying sometimes, actually. And uh, we can talk, but that's part of the ugly. Mm -hmm. It's. Um, so yeah, so it was what I thought it would be. There was more challenge, um, more posturing, more politic politicization, more partisanship than I expected. And, um, and that tells you something because I expected, I expected it. I just didn't expect that much. We'll talk about partisanship a little bit later, but I want, I want to talk about the ugly because you, you said two words that have been told to me by numerous other politicians who have come on this show soul crushing mm -hmm. being an mp is not a glamorous job people think you go off to ottawa you sit in an, a room all day and you basically don't do anything and get paid but it's not that and i i, I have talked to enough uh, politicians federally provincially that you know that if you're getting into it just for the paycheck, you should be going into another line of business. What was so soul crushing for you about the job? Um, it was the, it was the, and I won't name names here, but I, I'll give you a couple of circumstances. I'm a pretty straightforward person. I've been a business person all my life. You know, you, you, have challenges, um, but you always try and find a middle ground and work through them and, and find the best solution at the end. That's just, you know, I've, I've had, you know, dozens and dozens of staff over the years. Um, and you always try and, and be as um, genuine as you can. And I would, um, like I would have someone I'd be in, in a committee or, or some, or on the floor 
uh, in the House of Commons answering for the minister. And someone would just, it was more in committee, but someone would just be rude and vile in their tirade um, about, you know, whatever it was, because the cameras are on. And then once the cameras are off and the committee's finished or the meeting's finished, we're going down the hall and they say to me, oh my, how is your, I love your dress. Like this is, and just talks like we're, you know, going Best out friends, for, yeah. for coffee. And that to me, that's part of the soul destruction for me is that you just, you don't know which side is the real person. You are very cautious about sort of making those uh, friendships. And I know from former colleagues that were in parliament 20 years ago, 10 years ago, who have since left, one of the strengths was they would maybe not agree, but they get together for a beer or dinner and try and hash it out and come up with the best solution. But in my opinion, um, Stephen Harper and his uh, government really um, discouraged any kind of cross-partisan uh, relationships. And I know that for a fact because I've been told by those people who are told not, not to be, um, you know, not to be friendly with the opposition. I we think had, that hurt us. We had a former parliamentary secretary to the prime minister come on the show and say those exact words that uh, yeah. they are your opposition. They are your people who you do not talk to. You you get the clip, the 15 second sound bite, and you go about your day. You can be cordial, but you are not friends with people. And I think it has ruined our democracy in some sense. Mm -hmm. I do. And I remember Tom and I having, we had a tradition of having a Christmas party every year. And probably it was the year after I was elected, um, or maybe two. And one of my campaign team were there and, and someone came up to them and said, like, I'm looking around this room and there were, you know, 70 people there or so. And said, like, I see all these conservatives in the room. Like, and Michael turned to them and said, Kim and Tom have conservative friends. They have NDP friends. They have friends. We don't label them by their party. And, and that's what I guess I thought I was going to. And I found out very quickly that I was not. I And that's sad. It is. And this is where the show comes into play a little bit is because uh, after that 2015 election, I've seen political discourse in this country go downhill so fast that I, 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 it makes my head spin and people will tweet out something in 140 characters or 280 or however many characters and think it's okay, but they won't say it face to face. So I'm trying to bring back that face to face conversation. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. There has been media and it's always great to have someone who was there to explain what how they have uh, dealt with it and how they saw it. Did you have a good working relationship with the prime minister? I did. I did. Um, and I, if I wanted to meet with him, if I, I mean, we saw each other occasionally on a, you know, a social thing, like once or twice, we really didn't, nobody had time to socialize, but there would be a, um, you know, a caucus, winter caucus or something, and we'd have a chat and, and, but there were, there was one time he wanted to talk to me and one time I wanted to talk to him and both of those things happened. Um, other than, you know, sitting in the house waiting for the vote to be called or something, we're chatting about what kids, families, what have you. Um, I had a great relationship with him. I had, I know there have been those that, that have, um, would not say that, but I would say that 
of course i've caucus confidentiality for my yeah. life no so and, I, and i don't want i don't that. want my husband but does as I'm, well for his time at the cabinet so he knows but, that as well but i will say that i have very much respected um the prime minister and our caucus um because we heard this in the 2019 election and it was an issue um with jane and jody and what have you and i i as i said i should i have great respect for the restraint that we've all shown and so the narrative spun itself out without any input from those of us who were there and it's forever will be thus unless i write a book maybe i don't know we'll see um, everybody seems to want to write a book uh, but no i there's there are certain personalities that have power struggle i think written all over them and um you will you see that in politics but then the question is are you here for the greater good or are you here for you True. and in my opinion the prime minister is absolutely there for the greater good because if you think of his time since becoming prime minister whether it's donald trump or whether it's covid or whether it's you know um there were other things i have just lost them you know what i mean like there have been there's been a lot so um yeah i no. think i think he's got to be very tired i sure would be I, I thank you for being honest and upfront about that. And I understand with cabinet confidentiality, you can't say some things, but I appreciate that because uh, I guarantee you if I didn't ask that question, there'd be one person yelling at their computer screen or their car radio listening to this thing. Why didn't you ask that question? So, and I'll probably get mail from it anyway. So, and I'll yes. it's the way the world works. Um, parliamentary secretary to the minister of natural resources. You were talking to someone in Alberta. This is a big issue in Alberta natural resources. You are, you have a background in childcare. You have a background in entrepreneur. Getting that call from whoever you got the call from saying, congratulations, the prime minister wants to appoint you the parliamentary secretary to Jim Carr, the minister of natural resources. Take me through that phone call because we're oh, mouth, I remember that. mouth on floor. <laughs> I remember that like it was yesterday. I was on the train on the way to Ottawa. Okay. And I took the train every week um, because it came to Coburg and it was complimentary for all MPs. So I never had to charge mileage or whatever. I mean, some people chose to drove, drive. I took the train. It was amazing. Mark Garno and I were the two train people. The um, So... I was on the train on my way to Ottawa and I get the call and it was Mike McNair and the prime minister, it was hold for the prime minister, but then the prime minister couldn't do it. So Mike says, okay, Kimmy. And I know, I know Mike. And he said, um, the prime minister um, is appointing you as parliamentary secretary to the minister of natural resources. And so I sort of took a deep breath and I said, oh, I'm honored. That's wonderful. Um, okay i'm on my way i guess i'll find out more about what this means when i get there and tell the prime minister um i'll thank him in person but in the meantime tell him thank you very much i'm i'm you know i'm just so pleased that he has the confidence in me to do this so i hung up the phone i called my husband and i said um i'm the new parliamentary secretary to natural resources can't tell anybody for like two hours but here i am any very excited for me and no i my brain is going natural resources northumberland so then i get an so then when i get to ottawa and find out more about what this is as you know i ended up with the nuclear file for natural resources yep. and coburg and port hope is cameco uh you know supplier port of granby of <laughs> port granby Exactly, uh, the low level radioactive waste cleanup, uh, over a billion dollars. And, um, and BWXT is in Peterborough. I, like there was just so much, and Darlington of course is right on my, my border, uh, OPG. Yep. And so, so the pennies started to drop. 
And then I, there were, um, there were a number of reasons why I was in that role. Jim Carr is probably one of the most articulate, um, smart, uh, focused people I have ever met in my entire life. Just is. And when you're a parliamentary secretary, it can generally go one of two ways. You have a minister who wants to um, engage you, and I don't want to say use you, but yes, um, to his or her benefit um, in terms of their workload and their ability to be everywhere. And, and those ministers who kind of choose just not really to give the parliamentary secretaries much to do. Yeah. Well, Jim Carr, and I thank him for this many times, he had the, um, the uh, I guess, faith in me that I would be able to carry out the myriad of, of roles he needed me to do. And what that did was it really helped natural resources become a huge um, uh, sort of platform for a number of things. I helped the T I did the TMX consultations with all of caucus. TMX was part of my file. I did mining. I was in Nunavut. I went to the G20 for, um, for Jim Carr because Obama came to, President Obama came to Canada. And so with a few hours notice, I was on a plane, plane to Beijing and saying at the G20, I was on the ground for 48 hours because I made them promise they'd bring me back. And I landed June 30th at 11 o'clock at night so I could be in the candidate parades the next morning. Oh, wow. That is the life of a parliamentary secretary who has a portfolio that has, you know, work. And so I, I would stand up in, in, in the house and answer questions during question period um, when Jim Carr wasn't there. Um, you know, the prime minister answers the first number and then they go with ministers. So, yeah, it was um, it was for me probably the best experience on a, a work level that I've ever had in my life. Um, I, I'm going to ask you a question. Rep- I'm gonna ask I was you- going to say, though, except well, for representing the people who I live with, you know, my residents and my constituents, I got so much love and caring and, and support from the people in the riding. It allowed me to do that, to do both jobs well. And my team that was, you know, second to none. I'm going to ask you a question now, and I, I, you're going to put on your former parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources hat here for a second, because we have a lot of Alberta uh, Alberta <laughs> listeners on the show, as you can imagine, being a Calgary-based oh. show. Um, there is a narrative in Alberta that the Liberals do not do enough for on the natural resources file. Can you put them straight and say that they do, or, or can you say that Justin Trudeau might need to do more to get things done? Because there is a narrative that Justin Trudeau wants to shut down the resource sector. The liberals do not like the resource sector. And in your opinion, in your time in office at, in that job, was that the case? It's complete nonsense. I hear, and it is a narrative, but it's some, it's a narrative someone is creating without basis in fact, in my opinion. When I had the TMX caucus um, consultation and I had to talk to every caucus member to see if they were supportive, if they weren't, what else they needed to know, all of those things, that was my role. I will tell you overwhelmingly, every, every Liberal MP during that TMX consultation was in support of doing TMX. When the money came for the orphan wells, when like I went out to Fort Mac and and I'm I met with folks in Calgary and it's I remember and I I can say this because it's not caucus confidentiality at all but I can remember going to say to I said to some of these folks I was out there with Randy Bossano who is now the uh, minister for tourism. And what pe- lots of people are forgetting, he is also the Associate Minister of Finance, which is extremely important. And James Maloney, who was the chair of the Natural Resources Committee. And I finally said to a couple of folks around the table, you know, if you want to hear more positivity about the natural resources sector in Alberta and Saskatchewan, you might want to have a chat with the MPs that represent you, because they're the ones who stand up in the House and say, 
The government of Canada does not support natural resources. And folks, that goes all over the world. N not just people in Canada watch that or hear about that. Yeah. And there was a tacit understanding that I was right, that there's, um, there's a narrative that people are getting because in politics, it's about optics. It's about a narrative. And if, if the opposition can get something, um, you know, Michelle Rempel is now the uh, critic for um, natural resources. And there's, there's a, I mean, this is part of the challenge with politics these days, in my opinion, is we seem to go from zero to a thousand in 10 seconds, as opposed to having a reasonable conversation about this. And, and certainly from uh, Jim Carr's perspective and the work that he was doing and discussions with the prime minister, there was never, there, there has never ever been any kind of um, uh, sort of thoughts on no oil sands or oil sector, but what there is, is a continued push and a continued support for lowering the emissions in the oil sands. And those are two very different things. I mean, I remember when the first polypropylene plant was built in Alberta, we've been, people don't know, we've been shipping polypropylene from China forever. This was our first polypropylene plant and was built in Alberta. And there's a second one, I don't know if it's finished or not yet. We need oil. I said to Elizabeth May on the bus one day, driving around the precinct, I said, Elizabeth, your glasses are made of oil. Your toothbrush is made of oil. The clothes you're wearing are made of oil. The train and that so you're sitting need, on is made of oil. <laughs> exactly. And we need to help, help people understand that. A lot of the um, environmental activists who don't really understand that. Our response and my response, and I'm working, full disclosure, I'm a consultant with the Canadian Nuclear Association now. Um, it's not about stopping them. It is about making them cleaner and greener, as they say. And the oil companies are on board. They're, I look at Suncor, look at um, Total in, in Europe, uh, they're on board. They know and they're committed to it. But the narrative for political gain is not that, um, sadly. Before we get into the 2019 election, I have one last question about your days as parliamentary secretary. Looking back on it, because you, like you said, you were in China one day and you had to be back for Canada Day parades the next day. Time as a parliamentary secretary can take you away from being that local MP. And sometimes your constituents fall through the cracks because you, you might have a good team, but sometimes your constituents want that one-on-one. -on -one. Looking mm -hmm. back on it, would you have still said yes, knowing what you know now, knowing how much time you'd be away from the writing? I would. I would say yes, because I think I had a lot of value to the jobs and economic prosperity for this riding, particularly around the nuclear file, but also around mining. I mean, I'm in, um, oh God, what's the name of the oil company? In Imperial, I think it was in um, Calgary. And I'm looking and there's plate, there's a shovel and it's made of, it's made in Esco in Port Hope. And there's a, and a company that makes the plates for crushing the bitumen is here in Coburg on Brook Road. And so, so I feel like I, I, I did have value in my role back towards my constituency, but I managed, um, I managed. So my life was, I didn't go up to Ottawa. I went up every Sunday night. I came back Friday night on the train and I would often get right off the train and go to an event. And I was gone Saturday and usually Sunday morning to a market or something. My husband helped and um, he did a lot of, um, you know, events when I couldn't be there. And it, that was extremely helpful. My team were excellent. And I was always available by phone. And the advantage of now being in, in politics is you can do what we're doing right now yeah, um, to talk to folks. Awesome. And I would meet with people on the weekends. Uh, you know, you just, you fit it in, but they were long days. There's no question. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show with a quick visit to patreon.com 
and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Um, let's jump to 2019 now. Mm-hmm. The election uh, was not successful for you. You lost to uh, MP, now Philip Lawrence. Every campaign I've ran in, I always go in, and every campaign I've helped run, I always go in with the thought, you run like you're going to win no matter what. Even if you know you're 90 points behind and there is a 1% chance the only vote you'll get is yourself, you run like you're going to win. At what point of time in that 2019 election did it come to you and say, I might not do this, but internally you have to keep on going for your staff? Well, actually we didn't. Okay. Um, it was close. It was around it was. 3%. It, so it was close. Um, I kind of lost by what I won by last time. <laughs> it was, um, there was quite a nomination race for the conservative um, candidate. Mm-hmm. Yep. and um, who is a strong social conservative. And uh, so it was a, there was a, there's, when you run, you have to know where to put your energies. And so we put our energies where we had a chance uh, with, with voters that we had a chance. We didn't go to the social conservatives because we knew that, you know, there wasn't a good chance. There was um, not to say we didn't, we went to all the communities, but but it's hard. People would say, people would tweet or Facebook and say, you've never been to Norwood. Well, I've been there three times in the last 10 days, but because I didn't knock on their door, I wasn't in Norwood. And, and so that narrative gets created and is used by the opposition to say, see, she has, she wasn't, she doesn't care about the north part of the riding. She's never here. She didn't come at all. Well, I did. And my report to Elections Canada shows I did, but it doesn't matter. The narrative is out there. Yeah. So when you have a riding, a big rural riding that's as vast as this, and we have no media anymore, like no, um, you used to have the Coburg Daily Star, you have, there is an or no weekly paper, but there's very little ability to get any information to people. And, and as you said earlier, it's a tweet or it's a Facebook post and it doesn't have, have to have any truth or credibility to it. It just well, has to be up there. I don't understand this word truth. I, I don't understand that in the context of social media. It just doesn't seem to be right. Well, and, and I ha- always have refused to sort of, um, I, I, will t- I will tell people very clearly my position on women's right to choose, on medical assistance and dying. I supported that legislation. I spoke to it in the House. Um, and there were people who were vile in my constituency that were just names that we can't repeat because I did that. But you know what? You always will know where I stand. And, and that isn't always true with candidates. And there are some candidates who can sort of ride that fence and be whoever they want to be talking to whoever they're talking to. And so 2019 was an election where I had, um, I had lines drawn in the sand on issues like that. And it was amplified into a constituency that didn't support. So I certainly lost some of that. I also lost some of it because the prime minister's national numbers were not as high as they needed to be. And I can only make up a very small difference. We, in this riding, we need the, the prime minister's, the leader's numbers to be at a certain number. So I did everything we could. We ran a great campaign. We didn't leave anything on the table, but the odds, it's numbers. And there was nothing we could do, any more we could do about that. Yeah. So. <laughs> But look on the hindsight, the last MP from Orno, Ontario, which currently represents uh, Northampton, Peterborough South, resigned in disgrace over a $16 orange juice. So you never know. You never know. <laughs> Do you know, she support, Bev Otis supported me in 2015. She had a little event with me. She took me around. She was so mad 
at Stephen Harper. Yes. Yeah. So she be... didn't support me in 2019, though, I can tell you that. Oh, wow. Well. Um, yeah, but I... that's okay. Oh, good old Bev. I, I miss her. I miss covering that election with her. Um, my little, I, 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 I did not prep you for this. I said, if, I said at the beginning of the interview, in our pre-interview, is there anything off the table? And you said, no, you're an open book. So I hope it's okay because I, I people who have listened to the show know that I'm struggling right now with cancer and I am going through treatments and I am uh, hopefully as of this airing on the rebound of getting these things removed from my brain and being able to actually mm -hmm. cope in a positive way in society. But in 2021, uh, people approached you to run again, but you announced that you were not going to run again because of a diagnosis. Do you mind me talking mm -hmm. about that? No, I'm happy to talk about it. I've been very open about it. I've done interviews. Um, I feel it's something, it's a responsibility I have. Um, there's, uh, so in 20, so I didn't win in October of 2019. And I have been feeling sluggish, a bit tired, but and I had some symptoms of, you know, I don't know, just bloating and whatever. But I'd lost the election. I'm having to move a condo, my apartment from Ottawa. I, my daughter um, was, um, what was happening? There was things happening with my kids and good things, but so there was just a lot going on. And so I could talk it all away as we often do. Yes. And uh, in January, it was, um, it was uh, I was at the UnGala speaking of Alberta, in Toronto with the Canadian Nuclear Association. And I really was just feeling like I almost couldn't stand up. Went home on the weekend. I said to my husband, I think I need to go to the emergency. Something isn't right. I don't know what it is, but it's probably just, you know, a bug. I go and next thing you know, um, I'm fine. They need me back for a CAT scan at 6.30 in the morning. And I have ovarian cancer. And so I was diagnosed at stage three, um, high grade serous, which is 75% of us have. I was 62 years old. I'm having, um, as we um, record this, my birthday is tomorrow. So it's my second birthday since diagnosis. That's pretty exciting for me. And, um, you know, the survival rate is 50% uh, of us will survive by five, years, 40% will survive five years. But I'm not a big statistics person. I think character and, and personality and perseverance and all those things have lots to do with it. And so I went quite public about it. Um, I was planning to run uh, in 2021. And I had surgery in March of 2020, went through all you know the treatments, uh, the chemo, the what have you, and felt like a million bucks. And uh, New Year's Eve started feeling not great. And it turned out it came back. And ovarian cancer does not have a cure. It doesn't have anything as remission, sense of remission. So it's chronic. And you will be in treatment until no treatment is available that works. And so right up until then, I was running. And so I made the decision not to run. And uh, it was the right decision, uh, absolutely. But um, I'm now, I'm something called platinum resistant, which I had no idea what that means, but it means traditional treatments don't work. So I'm in a clinical trial right now, Princess Margaret Hospital, and feel very blessed that I am. And we have a great medical system. I just, it's amazing. And uh, I feel great. And I'm, I'm not going to stop till damn well makes me stop. So there you go. I appreciate you being open and upfront about that because... Um, after my diagnosis in J July of 2020, this is 2021, so 2020, so last July, I, uh, I, I, I wasn't up on the news back in Ontario at the time, but then I, I started doing research and I was trying to, because once you get, once you hear the big C word from the doctor, you start, you, you, you go down this rabbit hole that you should never go down because you find stats that you should not read because Dr. Google is a bad thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I will highly recommend you don't do that for anyone. Uh, but when, 
I, I found out that you weren't running and I learned why I was like, holy crap, this just doesn't affect people like myself. It affects members of parliament. Jim parliament. Carr. Yeah. Jim Carr as well. He was diagnosed. Uh, he and I had both the same time, but you want to hear a little bit of a funny, not funny, but kind of ironic story. When I stepped back from being a parliamentary secretary, when Amarjeet Sohi became the new minister of natural resources, and I still worked with Amarjeet on the nuclear file, so I'm still involved. But I stepped back because to your point earlier, I want to spend more time in the writing. I'd done my job as a parliamentary secretary, in my opinion, and others very well, but now I need to refocus. And so the prime minister put me on the finance committee with my friend, Pierre Poliev and Wayne Easter was the chair. And, and so it was quite the committee. And so I have been involved with ovarian cancer Canada through my daughter's best friend who had it in her twenties. And they came on the Hill every year and they had something called the lady balls campaign. I think it was a brilliant marketing strategy. So I became one of the champions and then I'm on the finance committee and the request comes in and I convince my other colleagues and the prime minister and Bill Morneau and other folks I talked to and said, you know, they've never, ovarian cancer has never had federal research money ever. Breast cancer has all sorts of other cancers, but never ovarian cancer. And this kills is the deadliest form of cancer for women there is. And it's, it, as a feminist government, it's time we stepped up. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of what I said to them. And so in budget April, 2019, we got $10 million over five years for ovarian cancer. Fast forward to my diagnosis, ironic. And one of the research projects, the BioDiva, I'm on. And it won't help me, but it will help the future science of finding, a cure. you know, I won't say a cure, but, but hopefully, more uh, options for ovarian cancer so so it appears that i'm i'm you were thinking foresight there it, that's very sad but yes i think you're right <laughs> so see when you say why did i think federally maybe i was meant to be there i i i, I try not to ask personal questions about uh, diagnosis and this you're you're the very first person who I've had on the show who's been diagnosed with cancer as well so uh, I, 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 mean this with, I, I, I mean this in all sincerity because I, I'm struggling like there are days that you struggle right because like mm -hmm. you said I, I had my first uh, uh, the first tumor removed back in March of this year it came back I went from mm -hmm. stage one to stage two and I, I've tried to keep up hope. I've tried to keep up positivity like yourself. And you seem like you're very positive. Yeah. When, at what point in time do you just have to say, okay, fuck it. I'm living my life no matter what happens. Because I, 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 I get to those points all the time where I say, you know what? People look at me and say, how, how do you keep on going with a diagnosis? Why don't I? What point, what, at what point was it for you when you said, fuck it, no matter what happens, I'm living my life, no matter what I have to go through, whether it be treatments in uh, downtown Toronto, whether it be an experimental treatment, I'm going to do it because I want to live my life the way I want to live my life. Um, from the minute I was diagnosed, really? it just, yep, I'm... Um, my mother died of lung cancer at 58. My father was 44. Uh, my brother just died a couple months ago. He was 54. Um, there is, um, and I was the good one. Uh, you know, <laughs> good eating habits, you know, all those kinds of, never smoked, they all did. Um, so for me, it was, there was no option. I mean, I have grandchildren. I have older grandchildren in the 20s, but we have a granddaughter who's going to be a year next month. Um, that's a big motivator. Um, my husband and I've been married for 40 some odd years, you know, the support and work that we put into our life, um, I'm not ready to, to stop. Um, but what I will say is I will do whatever it takes. And when I say I won't stop till it makes me, I'm in this clinical trial and I am fortunate. My, um, I'm very fortunate. Derek Nider, I don't know if you know Derek, he's the president of uh, Forest Products Association of Canada. 
And Derek um, is, he sat on the board of Ron McDonald's house and he's done a lot of work with, um, you know, trying to help people get, have the ability to get the treatments and get care. And he said to me, and he's absolutely right. Um, I am very lucky because of where I live. And, um, and the fact that I have the ability to do those extra things, um, to, like whether it's being in a hotel room or what have you, to be able to access this clinical trial. I have to be in Toronto most weeks for two days. Some weeks it's three days. And, but I'm doing it because I'm now stage four because not, I, nothing has worked. And, but I'm on this clinical trial and a week and a half ago, we got the results back from the CT scan and my tumors have shrunk by 25%. I'm happy so, thank you. But, you know, next time they might go up. You just, it's, it's the emotional roller coaster that you live on with this disease. It's, you think you've made a, a you know, movement ahead and then they say, well, you know, next time, even though you're still in the treatment, it might be up, it might be down, it might be the same. And it's like the, the bearer of don't, of the bear of lower expectations I find is, is what the medical team is, but that's their job and they should be. So yeah, I'm, my determination has been from the beginning. I allowed myself when I was first diagnosed to do what everybody does and cry and just feel like why me, but then why not me? And to your point, no one's special. Yeah. And um, when I, when I recurred, I allowed myself a day 24 hours and then when the second treatment didn't work stopped working um you know it was a shorter i feel sorry for myself and i have meltdowns of course i do i just get exhausted and tired and think oh my god and it's not about the treatment and the side effects a nurse said this to me the other day she said you know people think the losing of the hair the nausea which unfortunately I never had. All those things are the Lucky. hardest thing. She, yeah, I know. She says it's not the hardest thing. It's the emotional roller coaster and the toll it takes on you and your family who are trying to be strong for you. You're trying to be strong for them. And at the end of the day, um, you know, there's not a damn thing you can do about it except fight like hell. That's all. I agree. Um, just a quick, quick little story for me and for you as well. I'm not sure if you went through this, but I've actually gotten the doctor to stop telling me all the sort of the goods and the bads because it, the goods would make me feel great. And then the bads would just crash me down to earth like there's yeah. no tomorrow. So I said, tell me what I'm doing. That's all I want to know. I don't want to know if it's shrunk or if it's grown. Tell me what I'm doing every day when I come in here. What in what vein do you want me to open up for you? So that way you can find it so you can inject me with stuff. <laughs> like what at what point in time do I have to just say, okay, stop with what is potentially happening and just tell me what I'm doing? Because I'm sick and tired of this roller coaster of ups and downs that I've been going through for the last 19 months. I just want to have an actual day where I could just go in and shoot me with chemo or like pump me full of radiation as much as you possibly can because I just it's enough's enough so that's my little story on that one. yeah no I, and and it changes based on where you are in your headspace it changes on how and how much energy you have it changes on where you are in your treatment protocols it's it's there's no straight line there just isn't so my last question to for you Kim is this you have had an amazing career and it's still going because you're still a consultant with the Nuclear mm -hmm. Association of Canada, which congratulations uh, as a family member, as someone who was raised in a nuclear household. I, oh. I, I, I'm all for the nuclear reactors. My dad worked at Pickering. He's a consultant for OPG right now as well. So he, I, uh, we are very pro-nuclear in my household. Um, what does the future hold for you? Like what what's in store? Because that's where this is all going because would you ever decide to run for politics one more time or is that you did you've been there done that you got the scars to prove it yeah you know someone else has asked me that would I ever run again and i and my answer is no and and the reason it's no it's not because i don't think i could have had a better experience felt more 
accomplished, more fulfilled um, doing what I did for those four years. And I, you know, sometimes it, going back um, to what you did before is not necessarily healthy and the right thing to do. Uh, for some people, it may be. And if I was 30 or 40 and you asked me, I'd probably say sure, but I'm not. And so I have other things, you know, Tom and I have talked, we had planned to do a bunch of traveling, and of course, between COVID and, and cancer, the C's in my life, that sort of hasn't happened. But we'll do things, I'll do things. I, I love my work with the Nuclear Association. I sat on the Armed Fire Aerospace Advisory Board for a year and a half. I quite enjoyed that. Um, I connect with people and I want to continue to do that, whether that's, um, you know, maybe a vacation. We're booked as a family. Here's my go-to. Um, we're booked. So they offered me a, um, uh, an off week of my treatment if I wanted. We're what, I'm a technically palliative because there's no cure. And I hate that word because I've known it, the connotation is terrible. They need to change it. And I said, no, just keep going. I said, we leave on June 29th for Italy with my daughters, their spouses, and our baby granddaughter. That's my goal. Get me to Italy June 29th. And so, but as my daughter reminded me this weekend, I was diagnosed just before Stephanie became pregnant. I, I saw my granddaughter born. I wanted to see her first steps. She's had those. There are milestones that I, my, one of my grandsons got married. Um, he's an OPP officer up in Rainy River and he came down and got married. And so I've, I've had enough, I've hit a number of milestones and I'll just keep hitting them. And I'll just keep making them farther away. That's, yeah. that's my plan for the rest of my life. This, this, uh, the diagnosis of cancer changes your perspective on life and, it is that it's the milestones, right? Because uh, like my milestones are, Hey, I got through my first round of treatment. I got through my second round of treatment. I met my uh, nieces and nephews again. Um, it's mm -hmm. the small things. And I wish everyone, I, I, I know this is going to sound very bad and I apologize if it comes off that way. I wish everyone would have this experience because it makes a lot of things come into perspective the small insignificant fighting on social media, I, I, I look at them and I go, you have, we have bigger issues in this world to deal with. You gotta shake your head and just move on. And I, I, I love life as much as I do. And I try to be happy about it these days. And I just hope people get that out of life and hope people realize that the small things are the things that matter. Like the big grand scheme of things, look at the small things, look at the minute details. Look at, like you said, your second birthday after your diagnosis. Yet again, mine's a little bit different because I was diagnosed on my birthday. So I don't like to remember my birthday. Yeah. So, but it, it is true. I've had one birthday since I've been diagnosed and July 25th, 2022, that will be my second. So it's, it's small. Well, and we're, my youngest daughter just sent us a message and said, I need to confirm everyone's uh, wedding dates. And I'm thinking, okay, well, mine was before yours. But my oldest daughter and her wife, um, in December, they will be married 14 years. And to us, it feels like it was four years. Like time passes so quickly and we don't necessarily pay attention to all the stuff that happens as it does. And I think to your point, when you have a cancer diagnosis, you start to pay attention to all those things because you want to remember them. And, and one thing that, that um, technology has done has allowed, um, you know, my husband and I for Christmas from Kathy and Allie, they got us a book for Amira that we could read the story. So now she has a, a book for the rest of her life that has her grandfather's and my voices reading her a story. Like, how cool is that? And the videos that we do and the picture, like, it's, it, it will keep memories alive that we didn't have the opportunity to do 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I look at that as a positive. So um, I agree wholeheartedly. You have to look at them. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that one. But with that, we'll leave on a positive note. And that is the positive yeah. note. Um, Kim, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been, uh, I, I've been feeling a little bit, oh, I'm not sure if she just left or no. There we she, go. Yep, uh, I'm, I, I, I was having a bad week, weekend this weekend. I had a few uh, um, um, issues with my memory and my sight and my mm -hmm. um, body you. and tremors. And I had no mobility in my legs for a while, but these are the, these are the things that I like to do and they help me focus my mind during these treatments. So as yeah. much as I want to say thank you, I, I do appreciate everything you've done. I selfishly will say I'm happy that I did it with you because I'm happy to be able to chat with someone of your caliber and who has been that sort of a sort of someone who I've respected since you ran in 2011. So thank you for sitting down with me today. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I really enjoyed our chat. I, I was on a panel for ovarian cancer symposium last weekend. And I said, sharing is health is, is what I say, sharing is healing. Yeah. And I truly believe that when you talk to people about how, what's happening in your life and, and not always about the cancer, but about life, it helps you inside. I, I truly believe that. So um, I'm glad that we had this chance to talk and I'll be thinking about you as you're going into your surgery and you're, you'll send me a note and let me know how you're doing. Will do. Um, for everyone here, I would just want to say we will be back tomorrow morning with another community spotlight where we'll be shining a light on one of our great community organizations here in the city of Calgary. So tune in for that. For everyone here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast, have yourself an excellent rest of your Monday and keep talking. Thanks so much.